All right. And I've got 5.30, so that is great news. We're right on the button. We used to say in Army Aviation, plus or minus 30 seconds. Is that what you said in the Marines, too? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> great. You don't want to be too early or too late, right? <laughs> That's great. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. I think we'll um, we'll see people show up, and I know there's people joining on Facebook and who will also be joining later on um, to watch the replay, which is the beauty of this time and technology. But we're really, really fortunate with Friends of the Winthrop Library tonight to be joined by Elliot Ackerman. And this is a continuation of our virtual author chats. Uh, Elliot and I were just talking about how this time has allowed us to do things like this that would be very difficult to have coordinated in the past. And so this is really a wonderful opportunity uh, to have a chance to talk to somebody with a really quite unique background. So Elliot, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna go ahead and give uh, you a brief, a more formal introduction, and then, um, and then we're gonna let you take it away a little bit here. But Elia Ackerman is the author of most recently, and actually this is so recent that my copy has not yet arrived, uh, Red Dress in Black and White, Waiting for Eden, ah, oh, beautiful. And I love the cover too, it's awesome. <laughs> and now everyone else has seen it, so you have no excuse not to order. Waiting for Eden, Dark at the Crossing, and Green on Blue, as well as the memoir, Places and Names on War, Revolution, and Returning. His books have been nominated for the National Book Award, the Andrew Carnegie Medal in both fiction and nonfiction, and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. His writing often appears in Esquire, The New Yorker, and Time Magazine, and his stories have been included in the Best American Short Stories and the Best American Travel Writing. He's both a former White House Fellow and a Marine, having served five tours of duty in both Iraq and Afghanistan, where he received the Silver Star, the Bronze Star for Valor, and the Purple Heart. And he divides his time between New York and Washington, D.C. Uh, that is quite a bio. I know there's much, much more to it even than that, uh, but welcome, Elliot. It is really wonderful to have you here. Oh, great. Thanks for having me, Sharon. Yeah, absolutely. And before you get going, I know we've talked a little bit about the format here, and we're going to have a, um, you're going to read a little bit from your book, Red Dress in Black and White, but tell us a little bit about what, what the book's about and, uh, and how it is the same or different from what it is that you've written in the past. So, I mean, the title of the book uh, comes from, I lived in Istanbul for a number of, number of years working as a journalist, uh, where I was primarily covering the Syrian civil war, but actually wind up covering a lot of domestic uh, political issues inside of Turkey. And one of the most profound political issues inside of Turkey in the past decade were the 2013 Gezi Park protests. And for anyone who's not familiar with those, um, they were really sort of the, the closest thing Turkey had to an Arab Spring moment. And it represented a, a mass mobilization of people to protest against the uh, Turkish government, which at that time and still is uh, led by President Erdogan. And so this was hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. But one of the really iconic images that came out of that protest was of uh, a young woman, just a young professional woman who was on her way to work. She was wearing a red dress mm -hmm. slung over her shoulder uh, was a kind of white canvas tote bag. Um, so you sort of have the red and white being Turkey's national colors. And she had sort of started participating in the protests. And in the photograph, there's a police officer and he is sticking the nozzle of a pepper, sp uh, uh, pepper spray canister in her face and she's blowing pepper spray into her face and it gusts into her face or sort of a sweep of her black hair. And that became really the iconic image of the Gezi Park protests. Um, so the novel Red Dress in Black and White um, is, it's all set the present action of the novel is all set over a single day in Istanbul, uh, wow. several months after those protests, when an American woman who is living there, a woman named Catherine, and she's married, she's living there and she's married to a, a Turk, a uh, Turkish man named Murat, who is a real estate developer, uh, very successful. And she decides in this 24 hour period that she is going to flee Istanbul with her young son uh, and her American lover, who is a photographer named Peter. And one of the things that P Peter is sort of, say infamous for, but feels a lot of professional regret about was that he was at the Gezi Park protests, and this gets to the title of the book, and he also took a photograph of that very same woman, except his exposure of the photograph was not taken in, co in color, it was taken in black and white. And so 
what kind of gets revealed not only over the course of this 24 hour period where Catherine, the American woman, Marat, her real estate developer husband, and Peter are all kind of enmeshed in this crisis, which is Catherine trying to flee uh, the country. It's also told with chapters that flash back in time. So you start to understand this crisis in context. And it's a crisis that's both an interpersonal crisis, but a societal crisis. And you start to see not only through those three characters, but other characters, how in their lives, you know, the political has very much become personal. And the ripples from political events are still vibrating through their personal lives and affecting them. Uh, so that's sort of the, you know, in, in a nutshell, uh, the, 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 the book. And you've had phenomenal reviews uh, for your writing generally, but with this book in particular, we were looking at reviews from both the New York Times and the Washington Post. And uh, we were talking just before we started here that the title of the review in the Washington Post is that the red dress in black and white, a viral photo at a Turkish protest sets a plot in motion. And I wondered if you would talk before you, before you start your reading, would you talk briefly about, I mean, we could never have planned for you to come on a week after a viral video <laughs> set up protests and the nation in motion. So maybe talk a little bit about, um, not, not a, maybe a connection there or, or how you think about that. Well, I think oftentimes what we see, I mean, this, you know, this is not, not being specific to our moment, but some themes that are kind of universal through these types of moments, because I think we certainly see them, whether it, you know, is uh, what's going on today in the United States or the Arab Spring, um, it's usually pent up emotions, pent up sentiments, you know, pent up or structures or even kind of, you know, structures that aren't hidden, but maybe they're hidden in plain sight. Sure. And there's this massive accumulation and then something happens and sort of everything gets blown away and everything is, and everything is, is put under stress and, and we see what the result is. And oftentimes the result can be no real change. Um, sure. But what is but but much is revealed and i think this the book and the themes that the book deals with are these ideas of how um you know political events you know like the photograph of you know the woman in the red dress or like you know the uh, the george floyd video or the immolation of mohammed bouazizi many people might not know his name but he's the tunisian man who lit himself on fire and started the arab spring um you know, or going back through history, you know, when the, the monks burned themselves in Vietnam, uh, those images are catalyst, are they a catalyst for, for actions that reverberate all across society. And in, you know, in this, in this book, um, the kind of the catalyst is Catherine leaving Murat or trying to get away from him. And that shocks and shocks through their interpersonal world. Right. Wow. All right. Well, I feel like we need to let you read and then we'll uh, continue on with a few questions. Um, sure. So the, the part of the book I thought I would read would be a little bit, um, you know, one of the things, one of the ambitions I had for this book was, um, was to have Istanbul itself, the city, you know, kind of work in and should feel like a character in the book. And I mean that in that I want the reader to kind of have a real sense of the emotional resonance of that place, uh, whether they've been there or never been there. Um, because it's, it's, it's certainly uh, an important part of the book. But this section is, uh, it's, it begins in one of these present tense moments that I talked about. And it's the character Peter sitting in his apartment on the evening right before Catherine runs away. And he is reflecting on when they first met and their affair got going. And he's sort of looking out at the Bosphorus Bridge, the Bosphorus being the main waterway that not only divides the city of Istanbul, but divides the continents of Asia and Europe. Um, so the section begins, half past three that morning. His apartment has a view. It seems they all do. This is an advantage of living in a terrace city, one that reaches into the hills. The window by Peter's bed looks out on the first Bosphorus Bridge. Its spans and cables are ornamented with turquoise LED lights that reflect off the water, which glides past like black oil. The strong current swirls in the light and the surface of the deep strait swims with color. Forty years before, the bridge's construction had been touted as a great triumph. 
even though an unspoken shame surrounded its completion? Why had it taken more than a millennia to connect the two sides of this city? Looking at the bridge, he thinks of his exhibit from earlier in the evening, of the niece and the others, including Catherine, staring at two disconnected versions of themselves. These many years later, the bridge has not had the desired effect. After Gezi Park, the country is riven with divisions, and in this way, Peter can understand the shame associated with a bridge built too late. His head is on the pillow as he watches the current, hoping it might hypnotize him to sleep. The sunrise is still a few hours off, yet his mind roams, keeping him awake. Catherine knows he plans to leave. A, a he feels certain of it. it he's equally certain that she can't come with him, even if he wanted her to, which he doubts. She is bound up in Marat and their son. Perhaps this is why he had succumbed to their affair in the first place, because he knew that it could go nowhere, that it had to finish in this way. And since he already understood the nature of its ending, he could be absolved of responsibility, for they both knew this was the inevitable destination. As Peter looks at the bridge, his thoughts stray to what he considers their first night. Although they had met for dinner once before at the Istanbul Modern, this meeting occurred a few days later when they had bumped into one another at a gallery opening for the controversial artist Tanner Ceylon, whose violent, sexually charged, and hyper-realist paintings resembled photographs. After the event, they had searched the crowded streets for a taxi and had then wandered onto the bridge, which was more like a highway and usually closed for people to walk across. But it was open that day, so they had chosen to cross it together and, perhaps with a bit of luck, to find a ride home on its far side. In the center of the bridge, she had approached the railing, staring 200 feet below at the dark, churning current. She waved Peter toward her so that he might look as well. Come here, Peter. He remained a few steps from the railing and didn't move. Don't you want to look? We're right between Europe and Asia. We're not on any continent. She leaned deeply over the railing. This bridge is my favorite place in the city. This whole city is a bridge, said Peter. Maybe so, said Catherine. The Bosphorus ran dense as mercury beneath them. Peter glanced to its banks, to the two continents, to Istanbul, a city so illuminated that it banished the power of the moon. But you can't live on a bridge. Why don't you come back from the railing, Peter suggested. Are you afraid of heights, she asked. The wind was quick to carry away her voice and he could barely understand her. Everyone has one existential fear, she continued, but now she wasn't looking down. Instead, she stared at him and he could see the light from the water reflected from below its projection playing off her eyes. For instance, my husband, his fear is that he won't be a success, or at least that he won't measure up to his father. Peter offered a confused look, revealing the absurdity of this fear for a man whose business conquests riddled the skyline. It's not as ridiculous as you may think. None of us see ourselves as others see us, if only we could. Our vision of ourselves is like our voice. The world hears us one way, but inside our head, our voice sounds entirely different. There's no possibility of recording that voice, of sharing it with anyone. We go our whole lives without another person ever hearing us the way we hear ourselves. How people see themselves is the same, and there's no clearer way to understand that differing vision than to understand those insecurities. To understand that one fear. It had rained the hour before and the bridge light shone on the wet pathway. He asked what her fear was. Why should I tell you? He took one cautious step and then another, shuffling his feet as he transferred his weight, as though at any moment while he was drawing closer to her, the ground beneath him might fall away. Then he lunged forward and gripped the railing as desperately as if it were flotsam on the open ocean. He glanced up at her, smiling the heedless smile of an idiot, his eyes searching for some reaction, 
as if she might reward what he perceived to be his conquest of fear. Or, put another way, his courage when grasping the railing, even though he was paralyzed by heights. That night as they stood on the bridge, the wind kept snatching away their voices. Peter had needed to lean in close to Catherine so that he could be heard. The idea of falling terrifies me, he confessed. I can feel the vertigo in my stomach. The vertigo isn't from your fear of falling, she said. It's from your hidden desire to jump. That's why we feel vertigo. Peter pressed his body against the railing and took another deep look at the water below. So are you gonna tell me your fear, he asked. You weren't paying attention, she said. I just did. She told him to feel how her heart was beating. He reached for her wrist to take her pulse, but she said, we aren't children, are we? And placed his hand elsewhere. They had continued their crossing and on the far side, they finally found a cab. He held open the door for her and they climbed inside. Peter gave the driver his address. When he glanced back at Catherine so that she might give her address as well, she said nothing. Their taxi climbed the steep winding roads and through her omission, they both made their way back to his apartment. Neither of them spoke. Their eyes avoided one another's in the back seat. Past the door, a rocky bluff plunged hundreds of feet below. Peter was turned toward his window, away from her. He couldn't help but look at the drop. There's a lot going on there. <laughs> There's a lot. Wow. That is, uh, wow, that's, that's a incredibly intense setup. And I love that idea of, um, of how you're using the bridge and the bridge between continents and the bridge between halves of the city. And I imagine it's a bridge between many other things as well, maybe decisions and halves of lives. And, yeah. and I think the idea that in moments of transition, uh, we sometimes freeze, but you know, you can't live in those moments of transition. Eventually you have to go to, you know, you have to go to one side or you have to go uh, to the other. And yes. The present action of this book that I refer, keep referring to, you know, the 24 hours of this book, is right. one of the moments of transition. Right. So tell me about that, because I, I think I've only read, and I'm forgetting the name of the book now, actually. It's the um, British writer. He writes about, I think it's called Saturday, right? Yeah, in one day. So, yes, that's right. Um, so tell me about the decision to place an entire novel in one day. That's a... It seems like a challenge, but also it's pretty exciting. So yeah, how do you how do you come to that? Well, in this case, it actually, you know, it wasn't one of the original decisions of the book. I knew that the book was going to be about Catherine leaving, uh, yeah. but then it became obvious that that was happening over a condensed amount of time, okay. uh, and that you know one day seemed like a nice round way to do it, and um, and it seemed like that would get, you know that's probably was realistic as to how it would go. Um, but it, it led me in a direction where I needed to toggle to their backgrounds. And so you, you have a story that um, in these one day periods is very kind of, you know, intimate um, with many scenes like, you know, what, what was just read. But then as you toggle back to their past and there's about, you know, seven years that you're traveling here in their relationship um, right. and the son is seven years old. Um, so a little more than seven years. Um, you know, you're seeing a much wider vista of this society. So the book kind of, you know, it contracts and it expands. And I think, I hope, the ambition is that the, those contractions and those expansions inform one another and, and build. Wow. Wow. Was it difficult to write that way? Um, it, you know, it's, every book is a little bit different. I yeah. think this book was, um, aspects of this book were just, plot wise were more complex in the plotting in so much as you're dealing with time and you're dealing with different, you know, a lot of different characters and their stories. And you have to make sure that everything um, that they're, you know, that it, it's all woven together seamlessly and there are no knots or, uh, or, or storylines that don't jive together. So is it, so in that respect, it was a more, it's a, it's a more technical book uh, from a writer's perspective than some of the other books I've done. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. How how was it different otherwise? How would you say that it's different from from your other works? Obviously, different than nonfiction, but your other novels as well. Well, I think I mean 
I actually don't feel this is a big difference, but it's a difference people have commented on, which I think, you know, I'm not going to pretend it isn't a difference is, you know, I've written lots of books that are, that are, that are, uh, that take place in and around war and revolution. And, uh, and this one takes place around a conflict, a political conflict, but not necessarily a war. Um, yeah. I don't feel like that's a departure for me because the themes I'm writing about ideas of fidelity, marriage, family, are themes that have appeared in all of my novels um but the the setting in that respect is is somewhat different and a departure okay yeah yeah and obviously you lived in istanbul um but you've also lived in london and you've lived in many places what 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 about istanbul other than that there's a bridge over the bosphorus that divides the continents which is which is perfect for so many things, I'm sure. But what about it besides that made it the right location for this story? Well, I, I think, you know, Istanbul is one of these great, you know, there are these cities that are truly world cities. Yeah. Uh, and obviously Istanbul is a Turkish city, um, but it's a city that I've always felt belongs to all of us in much the same way kind of Paris belongs to all of us, Rome belongs to all of us, New York City belongs to all of us, uh, and Istanbul. And, no matter the, the city, the city itself will far endure whatever nation happens to be occupying it. And that has been the case back to when it was, you know, uh, Constantinople, Byzantium. I mean, it, you know, its history reaches so far back. So it felt very natural for me to try to tell this story in a setting uh, that is, it, is not only a timeless setting, but a very, very layered setting um, because the story is a layered story. And you get into the book, you'll see there's many, many layers in the relationships that connect uh, Peter to Catherine, to Marat, to other characters who work at the, you know, the American consulate there and to people who work in the, in the community of artists and expatriates that live in Istanbul. Um, so I really wanted to capture that. And I think also Istanbul at that moment was very much a society um, and not only crisis, but transition. And many of the themes that exist in this book are themes uh, that are very American themes, uh, not only at this moment, but you know, going back the last several years. And often I will feel, I feel in fiction at least, it's easier to touch on those themes that will, that you know, I think we all recognize. And if you, you, know, you pick up this book, I think you'll recognize them in this book but without writing about them in America, because things sometimes are so red hot, you can't reach people if you're gonna, if you're gonna go directly at the thing. So the, the best way to kind of discuss it is to tell a story set outside that context, because even me as a reader, I have a difficult time reading stories set in America of right now, it's too immediate. But a story yeah. set outside will help me see what's going on uh, in this country more clearly. For sure. So what, what made you, um, and actually I don't know where this is in the order of publication for your books, but did you start with your memoir and then move into fiction? Is that right? No, I, um, my fur, I wrote, uh, three novels and yeah. my fourth book was my memoir and this is my fifth book. Um, okay. So, but the, the memoir of, of those, of my books, places and names, um, which is really, it's really a memoir and essays. Sure. Uh, sort of the outlier book in so much as every other one of my books, I've had an idea for the book, the novel. I've sat down and I've started to try to execute the idea. And I've known that's what I was doing while I was writing. Okay. Place names. I also work as a, as I mentioned, I also work as a journalist and I was writing these essays for the places I write for and some of them longer pieces. And I got to sort of a certain point and uh, my, my wife looked at me one day and she said, well, you know, you're writing a book, right? <laughs> I sort of didn't realize I was writing but she's like you know yeah you you know you'll be covering what's going on you know in Syria or in Iraq or in Turkey and you'll inevitably be kind of going back and saying it reminds me of this time back in Iraq or Afghanistan or when I was younger and so it was this cost constant process of sort of looking at one series of events and seeing a different series of events reflected back to me um and she's like, yeah, you're writing a memoir. And I sort of thought about it. I was like, wow, you're right. And then I started sort of filling it out and, 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 and you know, connecting, putting the connective tissue between all these pieces and adding things to it. Um, but for a long time, I didn't realize I was writing that book. Um, and that was new, a new experience for me. Yeah, fascinating. Wow. And what is it like to go from fiction to, to nonfiction and then back into fiction? Is that, 
a little bit of whiplash or is it just just a different modality and so it's yeah, there's a lot more commonality than I think people would, would, would think. And I think there's a tradition that exists less today. I think the boundaries between those who write fiction and those who write nonfiction are a little bit more stark today than they were, let's say, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. There were, you know, we do have in our literature a long tradition of, you know, journalists and, and, uh, and novelists. Um, and I would, you know, I feel like a, maybe a little bit of a throwback to that. Um, but I feel like I am always trying to create the same effect uh yeah. in what i'm writing which is to write something that you know that feels true um yeah. but my tools are just a little bit different in uh in fiction and nonfiction. so you okay. know in obviously in nonfiction, you are uh inhibited by the facts and <laughs> fiction you are inhibited by your own imagination um sure. so you can one can pick which one is the greater inhibitor fair enough <laughs> It probably depends on the facts and the imagination, right? That's, that's right. the only type of day you're having, I think. That's right. That's fair enough. Well, tell us a little bit. I feel like this will also touch on some of the questions about your writing and about how you've approached it. But your background is in literature and history at Tufts, um, where you did very well. And, uh, and then you also studied at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. How, how does that, and I guess that makes that seems like a logical connection in terms of journalism. Less multiple tours in the Marines in combat. Um, so how did that decision of going from a humanities major at a top university into the Marines and, uh, and then coming back into journalism or, or maybe, maybe you weren't sure which way you were coming back. How did that, how did those transitions work for you or the decisions really? Um, well, it's funny, you know, the, I think it's very, you know, obviously we'll say, you know, it seems, it, just, it seems odd that you went from being, you know, I was in the Marines for eight years and it seems odd that one will go from being in the military to being. Elliot, I think I've got you frozen here. If anybody. The arts. Hello. Oh, there you are. Okay, good enough. Sorry, we got a, uh, missed you for just a moment, but <laughs> got you back. About that. Um, the point I was making was the people who, so it might seem odd to some people that a person who was in the Marines would go into the arts, um, mm -hmm. but the people who've actually known me the longest since I was young say, you know, Elliot, it's sort of odd. You're always this artistic kid, and we always thought it was so odd that you wound up in the Marines for so long. Right. Um, <laughs> and I think that's just symptomatic of the fact that, listen, all of us, like, we all contain multitudes. Uh, many interests, many things we want to do. Um, you know, I, I wanted to serve, I wanted to be in the Marines. I went and I had that experience and felt like I, you know, I had a very meaningful experience there, but I also knew that I wanted to write and always had an interest in, you know, history, literature, the humanities. Um, and so when it came time to, to leave my military career behind, it seemed to make sense to, to, to try to forge a career as a writer. Right. And did you, did you enter the Marines after 9-11? Is that right? Um, I did ROTC when I was at Tufts, and so 9-11 happened uh, while I was towards the end of my time uh, there. So uh, the, the military that I was sort of coming into was very different by the time I was receiving my commission as a lieutenant. Uh, yeah. Sure. Wow. That, that's, yeah, that's, that's. I'm sure you, you can sympathize. Very, yeah, very, very wild days. Yeah, very wild days. No, that's, uh, that's definitely fair. I'm older than you are, so. Um... It, it followed my service, actually, 9-11 did, by just about two months, which was all hard in a different way, um, yeah, to not be there. Um, maybe a couple, two more questions for you, and uh, just to not keep you too late here, but one of the things, and you can kind of get a feel from what you read, and also how you described you, the book at the beginning of, of our conversation, but secrets are a big part of this story. Um, in a marriage or in a family and society. Can you speak to this idea of secrets and, and their importance? Well, I think we all have our, you know, we all have the, we obviously all have secrets and oftentimes secrets are what sort of, are the architecture that under, that undergirds so much of our lives. And we might never see those secrets and they might not necessarily be malicious secrets or secrets. They might even be secrets that we are keeping from ourselves. But in moments of crises, uh, again, personal or societal, 
oftentimes those secrets are revealed in very dramatic ways and we're forced to, to reckon with them and sure. to figure out how and if we're going to change in light of the revelation of those secrets. And I don't want to give away the end of the book, but there are <laughs> secrets in this book and those secrets get revealed. The architecture of these characters' lives gets revealed in surprising ways. And then the question starts to become, how will they change and will they change at all? Um, and that, towards the latter parts of the book, very much becomes, I think, the, the question and the source of the narrative tension as we get to the end. Right. I'm actually going to lie. I've got two questions, uh, still two questions. So as I hear you talk about how your memoir ended up being shaped from a series of essays where your experiences, maybe as a journalist in different places, were helping you to recall other experiences. So maybe there was almost, a, I don't know if it was a friction or if it was um, something that, that keyed you into something else. Um, it, it seems like in this book as well that you have you have national events or international events, national in Turkey, that are then relating to the experiences of the characters in some sense, in some form or fashion. Is it, is it your experience, I'm going to get this right, but is it your experience that we are, are immediately shaped by the events that are around us, uh, whether they're our national events or our, our um, international events? It seems like that's been maybe been your experience or maybe been what you're suggesting in your writing, but how would you? I think we are, and we're not always conscious of how those events are, are shaping us. I mean, for more people, for some people more profoundly than others, but um, I think we often underestimate how much these large events shape our lives. I think we're actually right now in the midst of one that is clearly shaping our lives because we're all you know, we're all sitting at home and have been staying at home for three months or quarantined or, you know, great limitations have been placed on what we're able to do in our lives. But, right. um, uh, but I think we're seeing, you know, with this protest movement, very dramatic manifestations of political discontent that are, that are affecting our lives. And I'm sure there are people, you know, all over the country where those issues are affecting their interpersonal relationships as well. Um, so to tell the story of those events, I think you also have to tell the story of how they affect the people who are caught up in them. And that's what I, you know, that's, that's what I endeavor to do in, in not only red dress and black and white, but in all of my books. Wow. That's very powerful. No, I, th I think that's really exciting. I, it's exciting. And it's also both, um, I don't know if it's frightening or, or, or maybe sobering is a better word, especially in the light of current events. Right. Yeah. So. I like to think that we have some agency in how we are shaped uh, to a degree. So I, I suppose there's the uh, there's the silver lining. <laughs> but I think we I know I think we do have agency. But I but it, it's um, you know you can't tell the stories of communities, uh, political communities, nations, uh, or even local communities without telling the stories of the people. I mean it's obvious without telling the the stories of the people who are in inside of those communities. Um, yeah. And I, right now we're you know we're all learning a lot about our community. For sure. For sure. All right. So my last question, and I feel like it's like Krista Tippett. She's got her first question. She starts with, I have my last one I end with. Um, we are uh, calling you from a small community out in rural Washington state and um, a very big, big group of readers out here, but a, a rural community that has all of the challenges of a rural community and certainly a lot of acute needs right now, in addition to the longstanding uh, challenges that we have. For this community, what would you say to a community that is finishing up our capital campaign for a new library? We still have a gap of $400,000 to raise, but, um, but have had incredible response from donors so far. And we're really bringing, bringing the community into this last phase. What would you say to a community about a new library, about the opportunities, well, and uh, how to think about that? Yeah, and you know, and libraries are the secular churches of America. Um, I believe that, you know, we are not a nation of blood and soil. The thing that makes us unique is that we are a nation that has an idea and a sense of it ourselves. We all disagree about that, but that idea leads up to an ideal. And we argue about the ideal that we are vigorously, but it's an ideal. Those ideals are built on ideas. And where do ideas live? Ideas live in libraries. And libraries are democratic. Libraries are where everybody can go. Um, so they are our secular churches. So a community that wants to invest in itself needs to invest in its library. It, it's essential. Thank you. And do you have a story that's your favorite story from how a library has impacted you? Yeah. Um, 
I have a couple, you know, when I was young, I was born in LA and when I was nine years old, I moved to London yeah. um, in January. So just think about that, you know, Los Angeles to London in January, you're nine years old. Like it was very sort of jarring for me. And this was, it was 1990. Um, there were four TV channels in London. Like, you know, I came from like the Mecca of movies and Hollywood and all of that. So, so culturally my head was spinning, but one of my, uh, one of my favorite items or most treasured items um, was, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it was the boys King Arthur illustrated by N.C. Wyatt, the painter, or these just, you know, beautiful paintings of King Arthur. And I mean, you know, I wound up in the Marines. So obviously I'm the kid who liked King Arthur. Um, and uh, that book didn't make it with us in the first move to London. I got lost with the movers and I was kind of feeling upset. And one day my mother said, you know, took me down. I was trying to settle in. My mother took me to our local library in London and said, I bet we can find it here. And we did. And we found a copy of that book. Um, you know, and for a little kid who had just had his whole world turned upside down, you know, having that, having that same edition of the NCY at Boys, Boys King Arthur, you know, let me this way, I'm sitting here with you 30 plus years later talking about it. So obviously it meant something. That, I, I think, I feel like that's, it's foundational and for, formational for, for most of us, certainly writers, right? So absolutely. Um, you know, and, and for someone coming in, I was coming into a new community to find a book that was so important to me in my old community and my new community made me feel like, okay, maybe I can be part of this, of this new world I'm moving into. And that really shows that connection that we have with ideas as well, right? Across yeah. the world and, and, and around the globe. Elliot, thank you for your time. It's really great to talk with you. I know that, uh, that the folks that are part of this on the various places that it's streaming are going to be rushing out to, uh, to read you if they haven't already, and I'm among those. And we're really looking forward to, uh, to finding out the secrets at the end of the book. And what the characters do. Red dress in black and white. Red dress in black and white. Thank you so much, Elliot. Take good care. Yeah, real pleasure. All right. Bye bye.